At dawn, you're free to uh, tell Sally that we greeted everyone this morning with a holy kiss, and, you know, we can't wait to give her one as well. <laughs> so, you know, that's if you feel like, you know, uh, uh, pulling her chain. So this morning's question is, what happens to us when we die? This is one of Sally's questions, and uh, just like last week, even though Sally's not here, Sally, we hope you're listening and, and uh, watch this, this later. And uh, again, if, if anyone has any questions after this, it was impossible to put everything that I studied into one lesson. Um, and so there may, be, there may be some small parts that we've left out, but I tried to get the broad picture of what happens to us when we die. And again, this is a very controversial subject, a subject in which Bible scholars and, and Christians for centuries have uh, questioned because there's not, there's, there's a lot of information, but it, it, a lot of it is very obscure. And so we're going to attempt to look at this in a Bible perspective of what happens to us when Questions, you know, sometimes you'll question, do we go directly to heaven or hell? Do we fall into, do we, into a deep sleep? Um, do we simply cease to exist? And we, we, I remember several funerals. We've got one preacher in the neighborhood and where we live that every time there's a funeral in, in that church, he talks about folks jumping on clouds. And so, but, but what does the Bible really tell us? And that's, that's the bottom line. I mean, this, this is, is important for us to, to, to answer questions like this from the scriptures. But bear in mind also, if, if we have a differing point of view on the scriptures, this is not necessarily a salvation issue. Um, but I do think it would be good if we if we disagree on this subject to sit down and study it farther, um, because it is it is a controversial study, and I'm not trying to be controversial in any way, shape, or form. But I would like for us to be able to agree on what the is. first of all, what is death? Death is simply a separation of the soul from the body. I want us to look at what Solomon says back in the book of Ecclesiastes and in the last chapter, chapter 12, Solomon describes death. Actually, the book of Ecclesiastes, someone, someone took the wind out of my sails years ago because I love the book of Ecclesiastes. There's so much wonderful information in it. And we were out in Springfield, Missouri, where, where Kate used to worship when, and Celia and Steve when they lived out there. And, and the, the, the young man that they had preaching at the time when we visited back there at Southside Springfield, is, uh, they, they, uh, he said that Ecclesiastes is such a depressing book. And I thought, oh man, I've never viewed it as a depressing book. But what it is, is it is Solomon's writings at the end of his life. And indeed, if you do choose to look at it as depressing, I could understand that. I have never viewed Ecclesiastes as depressing, but he does write a lot about the things that come to pass when one dies. And in chapter 12, and down in verse 7, Solomon says, And the dust returns to the earth as it was. But think about that. That, if we stopped right there, would be very depressing. But here's the positive side and what I've always found so wonderful about the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon is like the Apostle Paul. He does not leave us, if you will, in the depths of despair. But he brings us to a positive and he says, he says, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Okay, so all of our work on the earth is vanity in the grand scheme of things, as, as Solomon says. But on the bright side, when our soul separates from the body, after the body is broken down, generally after the body is broken down anyway, then we return to God. 
If you'll look, take a moment to go back into your New Testaments, the book of James. James chapter 2. In James chapter 2 and, and down in verse 26 of that very last verse of that chapter, For the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. James is making a point about our, our living faith, our actions and and putting our faith into practice, but he makes a very simple statement there that the body without the soul or the spirit is dead. And so really what it is that gives us life is the spirit that God gave us. Now, it's interesting, Solomon also back in the book of Ecclesiastes points out that no person has the ability to retain the spirit. Uh, when I was very young, I think I was very young, maybe maybe even, uh, maybe it was before I was even born, uh, Walt Disney died. And Walt Disney, I believe his body, if, if my understanding is correct, his body is still frozen somewhere to this day. Now you guys don't know who Walt Disney is, but you know who Mickey Mouse is and Donald Duck. Walt Disney was the artist who drew all those characters. And so he was very famous and very wealthy. But Walt Disney had this, uh, this vision that someday science would advance far enough that we would be able to, to unthaw his body, to fix whatever was wrong with it, and rejuvenate his life. Well, Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and in verse 8 says this, No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when a man had power over man to his hurt. Solomon is saying very plainly, it is not within our power to determine whether or not we live longer than what God would have us to live. Death with a few, a few exceptions, while Jesus and the apostles were on earth, you'll read about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, and you'll read about, you know, Peter. We just studied Peter uh, a few weeks ago, raising Dorcas from the dead. Um, but with very few exceptions, death happens once. Earthly death happens once. The Hebrew writer clarifies that for us in Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 27. Sorry, let me get back here to Hebrews chapter 9. And down in verse 27, the Hebrew writer says this. He says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So we see a, we see a little glimpse here at what happens after we die. The body decays. First Peter chapter 24 makes it very clear. Solomon made it very clear in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 that the body decays. Uh, science would, would verify that. We can, we can look at, at the body and its various states of decay. Some parts of the world it decays at a slower rate. Perhaps embalming might slow the, the decaying of the body down, but Ultimately, it's going to decay. It is going to break down and there's not going to be life in it. 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 24, Peter says, For all flesh is like grass and, it's, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So Peter reminds us we're just nothing more than, than, a, than a flower. 
life here today and gone tomorrow. We enjoy it. Life might be beautiful in its time, but then the flower begins to fade and our bodies begin to break down. I also want to notice that life does not necessarily begin on the earth, nor is it here that life actually ends. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul uh, talks here a little bit about life, and I want you to notice something that he says. Now, I find it interesting the spirit does not originate in earth. The spirit does join the body on earth, and physical life begins at conception. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 5, Paul says, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We'll get back to that passage again, possibly read a little bit more from that passage. But I want to emphasize that God gave us our spirits. And he joined that spirit with our body at conception. All refers to death as a sleep. When speaking of those who have died... He refers to them as being asleep. Job, David, Solomon, and others throughout the scripture refer to this as a sleep. Although we'll look at this, but bear in mind, sleep is the, the, the most predominant depiction of a, a soul that has departed the body. I want to go to 1 Thessalonians very quickly here and see what the Apostle Paul actually says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And in verse 14, Paul says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus will God bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And so that we, we probably, none of us would dispute that Paul is referring to those who have died. What is that sleep like? God has prepared a place for departed souls. Souls that are separated from the body. God has prepared a place for that. And even though Paul refers to it as sleep, we, we, we're going to try to get a little bit broader picture of what that sleep that Paul refers to. Yeah, and depending on your translations, if you're reading from the King James Version, your Bible will translate it as hell. If you're reading from the English Standard or more modern translations that are more accurate, in the Old Testament, you'll find a word, sheol. S-H-E-O-L. It is a Hebrew word describing this place that God has designed for souls who have departed the body and are yet awaiting judgment. We know from the book of Revelation, judgment will occur at the end of time. We'll get to that in a moment. But Sheol is very, very difficult for us to understand because it is, it is like so many Hebrew words. And the Hebrew language is, it baffles me. I've studied a little bit of Hebrew and, and it is very difficult for me to grasp because Hebrew words have so many meanings. Kids, what did we study about in our creation class on Wednesday? A couple Wednesdays ago, we looked at a particular word. You remember what that word was? Yeah, no, way. no, yes, no, okay. All right, it was the Hebrew word for day. And it has three different meanings. All three meanings are used and present in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. And so Sheol is like that. It can, it's used about 31 times in the Old Testament. And it can mean a place of torment, which we know of as hell. Or it can mean a place of departed souls waiting judgment. The context has to be used to determine which the meaning is. And more modern translations will leave the word Sheol 
in places where they think that it means the place of departed souls. And they will use the word hell in place where they believe that it means eternal torment. All right, I want to give you a very quick reference here and demonstrate my point in Psalms chapter 16. If you're looking at this, the King James Version, it will refer to this as hell. But I want you to read this, Psalm 16, and in verse 10. In Psalm 16 and in verse 10, this is a prophetic psalm of something yet to pass. The English Standard Version reads this way. For you will not abandon my soul to shield, or let your Holy One see corruption. Now we know from what Peter says in Acts chapter 2, this was a prophecy about Jesus Christ and how his body would not decay as a normal body. And nor would his soul remain in Sheol, but his, his body and soul would be reunited at his resurrection. And so we know that Sheol is the same thing as the New Testament word Hades, because Peter uses this passage and quotes it, but it is recorded for us in the Greek text as Hades. Acts chapter 2, verse 31. Peter says, uh, for, he's, for he saw, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And so we know that that's what Peter, what the Hebrew word in Psalms 16.10 is talking about. All right, I want to move out of this because... Hebrews and Greek languages are, are something that have a place, but it's not something that is necessary for our study. Hades is the Greek word for the place of departed souls. Again, King James will, ver will render that as hell. They also render the word for hell, which is Gehenna, as hell as well. So confusion has arisen over that. Hades, the Bible doesn't give us a ton of information about Hades. I'm going to refer to this as Hades because it's easier for me to wrap my mind around one word than two. But Hades, what does the Bible say? The word Hades is used nine or ten times. There's some question about Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. We won't go into that. The English Standard Version has rendered that hell instead of leaving it as Hades. Most simply reference Hades as a place. They reference it that it exists. Peter tells us that Jesus' soul went to Hades. We looked at that, Acts chapter 2, verse 31. And so his soul was in Hades. His soul was in this place when it departed the body. As he was hanging on the cross... And the, the Bible says he bowed his head and gave up the ghost or died, depending on which gospel you're looking at. At that point, his soul departed from his body and went to this place of rest. You now he promised the thief on the cross. He said, this day you will be with me in paradise. And so I, I, I believe that that indicates the the thief on the cross went to this place, this place of rest for departed souls. You know, in Revelations chapter 1, Jesus holds the keys to Hades. I'm not going to go back there for a moment because we'll reference it again in a minute. The most vivid, vivid description appears in Luke chapter 16. If you'll turn there some time in Luke chapter 16 because it is the most vivid description of that Jesus gives in, in this account of Lazarus and the rich man. Bear in mind, I've been in some very heated discussions on this. So I want to be cautious in our study of this. Christians argue whether or not this is a parable or reality. 
I'm going to stick my neck out on the line and say, I believe after study with several individuals, study on my own, I believe that this is reality that Jesus is talking about. However, Jesus gives this account for a purpose. The purpose of his giving this account is to tell us to make preparations for death. But in that account, he gives us a glimpse of Hades. And so be cautious as you read this. We don't want to read more into it than what is written because it is a highly disputed passage. There are certain things that we know from this passage. The first thing we know, and actually I'm just going to read this passage and then it'll put us into our minds. But the first thing we know is that there are two parts to Hades. All right? Let me get back here for a moment. I'm going to find where I'm at in my Bible. Luke chapter 16 and in verse 19. If you'll begin there, we'll read this together and then we'll, we'll look at what it says. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and sent Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm, or your King James Version will say gulf has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able. And none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. So there he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if one should rise from the dead. And so here I think Jesus is also making a point. Not only is there a point to prepare for death, but there is a point that he is prophesying that there are those who will not listen about his personal resurrection from the dead. We also see here that there are two parts. There is a part in which Lazarus dwells in peace and rest. There is a part where the rich man, even though he has not yet been judged, is waiting in torment. Um, and, and I kind of look at this as, as, as and this is in my mind, not, this is not scripture, but it's my mind. I look at this as being a place awaiting judgment. If you're in jail and you're perfectly innocent, you have peace. Jesus said, I, I have come to bring peace. And that peace that Jesus came to bring was a peace between us and God. Abraham is there. Lazarus is at rest. He's at peace. He's resting with Abraham in this place. On the other hand, we have a rich man who certainly seems like he was selfish in his life. We have a man who, who did not 
follow what he should have followed. He had no, no heart for Lazarus, a man who was in his own gate, day in and day out, begging. And so his selfishness brought him to a place where he's tormented. Second thing we notice is a person's soul cannot pass from one part to the other part. Abraham makes that clear in his conversation with this rich man. That one can't go from one section to the other. One is placed there and held in that place. So that kind of blows, before we move on to our third point, it kind of blows the idea of purgatory. Growing up in the Catholic Church, we were taught that there was purgatory and, and, and it was a place that was temporary that one could be, uh, after a period of time, be released from. Or that if someone here living on earth, I remember, I remember my dad lighting candles in the church uh, uh, for those who had gone on before. There's a particular day set aside. It's, it's uh, November 1st. It's, it's kind of a, a Catholic version of Halloween. It was called All Souls Day in which people would gather at the church buildings to pray for those who had departed, that they would be released from purgatory. And yet here in this account and for everything that I've been able to study through the scriptures, a person cannot be released from Hades or from any part of Hades until Jesus opens Hades up at the judgment day. All right, so the rich man was afraid uh, the ones he loved would end up in the same place that he was. And so he was aware, at least in Hades, he was aware that he had others left on earth that he had a concern for. This seems to be a portion of his torment as well, a mental anguish for those who were on the earth living, so much so that he desired that one go back from the dead and warn his five brothers so that they would not end up in the same place. I want you to notice that in, and I'm not going to go back there for time's sake this morning, but if you go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, Solomon says, there is no knowledge, my words, no knowledge after death of earthly events. And so while the rich man was aware that his brothers were still alive, it does not seem that he would have had, if what Solomon says is correct here, in harmonizing the scriptures, it would not seem that he had knowledge of their actions on earth, nor was there a way to communicate. You know, in Hollywood, we see movies. I, I love Ben Crosby and Bob Hope. I watched those as kids, and I remember one particular movie that the two people were acting together in, and, and one of them's aunt was was looking down from heaven, and she would she would send down a lightning bolt every once in a while and shock someone. Well, you know, he, he's th th this is this is uh, a fictitious thing, and, and so it it appears from several passages, but Ecclesiastes nine ten seems to make it the clearest that there's no knowledge of earthly events. So no one's, no one who has departed this life and is in, in Hades, whichever part of Hades they might be in, there's, there's no knowledge of what we're doing today, uh, even, though, even though it's something that we like to think might be. But remember, Hades is not permanent. Hades is not a permanent place. Jesus will open Hades at the end of time. And he's going to open it up. Souls will depart from Hades. I want you to go back. I mentioned we'd go back here to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, where Jesus talks about having the key. He already has the key. He has the ability. Remember, that was part of what he accomplished in his death on the cross was to demonstrate that he was stronger than death and that he had power to release his body and his spirit from each other and then reunite them in his resurrection. And so he demonstrated for us, for our faith, that he has power over this. Revelation 1 and 18 says, 
Uh, let's actually back up to verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John saw Jesus. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Right there for the things that you have seen, those that are, those that, are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Bottom line, Jesus has the ability and he will end this place called Hades. As a son of God, he has that authority. He has that power to do that because of what he accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. James chapter 5. And down in verse... Uh, I think I've got this wrong. The wrong... Uh, sorry, I've got the wrong verses written down here on, my, on the screen. Um, we'll skip that. I'll, I'll, I'll look that up again. Paul says that like Jesus, remember Jesus had a, a body. He reunited with his earthly body. Paul says that we will have new bodies. Even though our old bodies are decayed in the grave, Paul says that we will have new bodies bodies. These bodies will not be corruptible. They won't be something that's subject to decay or deterioration. Let's look at what he says here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15 deals, the whole chapter deals with this, the resurrection. Um, and of course, this is, this is after, this is, this is the resurrection of the dead. This is after the period of Hades, when Jesus opens Hades up. 1 Corinthians 15 and down in verse 50, if you will. Paul says, I tell you this, my brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, bear that in mind. Our bodies that we receive from God are not going to be flesh. They're not going to be blood. They're not going to be the same as we have right now. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. So in other words, not everyone on the earth is going to die. Not every person is going to experience death. There will be those alive when Jesus returns. There will be those alive who will be caught up into the air with him. He says that at that point, we will be changed, whether we're alive or whether we're dead. He says, in the moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. He says, for this perishable body must put on, in the, uh, on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your, or, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And he continues on from that and what the strength of sin is. References in John. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, the, the Jesus authority is in, thank you, that I, I misread it, I glanced at it, and it's, it's James or John chapter 5, verse 29. I won't go back there because we're, we're over the time that I've allotted for this, but the departed souls will rise to judgment. Uh, at, at this time, when Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about Jesus returning to the earth, he's talking about that resurrection morning. We sing about that resurrection morning. 
And in Revelation chapter 20 and 21, if you go back there, John gives us a very vivid description of what that resurrection morning will be, a resurrection to the judgment. We don't know if it'll be morning or night, but we tend to sing about morning, I suppose, because it is a, uh, such a pleasant time of day and a time of new beginnings. But in Revelation chapter 20 and in verse 12, through 13. John says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by the things that were written in the books according to what they had done. He says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And so we see a very vivid description of those who have died rising from the dead. And we also notice that Hades is releasing those souls who are waiting there. Hades will be destroyed. The end of Hades is found in the following verse. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is hell. The lake of fire is a very vivid description of hell. Death and Hades are going to be destroyed in hell. He says this is the second death, the lake of fire. All right, I want you to think about that. At this point, judgment is taking place. And John says, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, Remember, we're going to be judged by how we lived on earth, how we spent our time, what we did. And if our name is not written in the book of life, we will be thrown into the lake of fire. We continue reading about this judgment down in chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. What a wonderful description of such a blessed time. And we know this as heaven. It is heaven, as Paul refers to it in, in one of his letters to the Corinthians, it is, it is the third heaven. It is paradise. It is the place of bliss. And so... Again, if we want to study this more, we can study this more. I don't think that it has a bearing on our salvation necessarily if we don't understand it. But it is something that intrigues our minds. What does happen to us when we die? But what can we take away from this study that might be applicable to our everyday lives? What can we learn from this that will make us better Christians tomorrow than we have been today than we have been in the past. Well, I think the first thing is, just like Jesus' point in Lazarus and the rich man, we need to take time to be holy. We need to take time to focus on God. Being holy doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're some sort of pious people. But it means that we're God-like. God is holy and we're to be holy like he is to the best of our ability. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action. This is where holiness begins in the mind. And being sober-minded, let your hope, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, also be holy in your conduct. 
Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially, according to each man's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. In other words, through our time on the earth, conduct ourselves with a consciousness that God is going to judge us and he's going to judge us righteously. And also remember, remember death is not something to be feared. A lot of, I think that's probably the greatest benefit to studying this is to realize we don't need to fear death. Simply a separation of soul and body. Certainly we have reasons that we want to live and we want to continue our lives. But death is not something to be feared. It is not something that we should... Uh, React as one who has no hope, because we do have hope. As Christians, we have hope that someday heaven will be our home. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eight. Yes, we are of good comfort or courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Paul's, Paul's actions indicate that he would rather. Rather, go ahead and die and be with God, be in that place of rest, than he would be on the earth. Although he does say in several places that it is better for him, for Christians, to remain a little bit longer. But Paul had no fear of death. In Philippians chapter 1, and in verse 20, Paul says, As it is my eager expectation and hope, that I will not be at all ashamed, but what with full courage. Now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. That's the point that the Apostle Paul makes. He does not fear death. In fact, he looks forward to death. And so we as Christians should have the opportunity to look forward to eternity in heaven, just as the Apostle Paul did. Let's say in turn to 661, there is a gate. And that gate is entrance into the kingdom of Christ. There is a gate.